here tonight. Um, this is Wednesday, October 11th, 2006. Um, his co-author is in San Francisco right now launching the book there, so it's up to us to kick off the party here. Uh, your being here is very important. All of us, <clears throat> well, if each one of us buys 500 books or gets 500 friends to buy a book, we'll be able to get it on the New York Times bestseller list. So we're trying to do that. We'll shoot for that. And I'm going to introduce the four people who are going to read, and they can kind of raise their hands so you'll know who they are when they step up. Timmons, who is one of the co-authors of this wonderful book. the definitive biography on the late and legendary Harry Hay, gay activist, founder of the Manishing Society of the Radical Fairies, and granddaddy of the gay consciousness movement. An Angelito since 1976, when he arrived as a student at UCLA, Stewart has also been widely active as a local journalist, helping to blow the cover on the Belmont High School scandal, and currently working to end working poverty in LA and curb Walmart's conquest of the planet via his work at the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. Also, the former director of the One Institute at USC, the largest gay and lesbian archive in the nation, and has extraordinary taste in jewelry. <laughs> um, be sure to ask him about the mule of Glendora. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm going to uh, zip through this in the breach. I know that Mink is, is trying to park, and we'll be here in just another hour. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I, I had hoped, and I'm uh, so glad that all the uh, readers were able to take us on a little sort of trip hop through queer time, uh, only which will go to uh, about uh, 1971, and I'll uh, zip through that now, and then then uh, talk a little, and then we can have a few questions and answers if you have any. Um, gay men and lesbians in the LA Gay Liberation Front believe that flamboyant militant actions were indispensable tools for bringing about social change. By the first months of, of 1970, GLFers, in an incredible burst of energy, were making themselves felt everywhere. They slapped day glow stickers of crossbones superimposed on the head of a pig, i.e. police, on phone poles and on restroom walls to warn cruising men about LAPD surveillance. They staged noisy demonstrations at the Los Angeles Times because it refused to publish the word gay. Uh, the paper soon changed its name, either way is even running a five-part sympathetic article uh, in, about the woman homosexual in June of 1970. They ceaselessly picketed Barney's Beanery, a famous West Coast eatery on whose wall hung the illiterate sign, faggots with one G, stay out. <laughs> it had been a fixture at Barney's for two decades, but now it came down. They targeted offensive presentations of gay people on television, protesting the appearance of Gay Gaylord, a recurring character on The Carol Burnett Show in the sketch as The Stomach Turns. <coughs> The show's producers eliminated the character and expressed an unprecedented contrition for the entertainment industry's uh, public homophobia writing to GLF, we hope you will accept our apology for having offended you. The Gay Liberation Front also battled against the uh, LA Gay Bar's antiquated rules against social touching, which dated back to at least the 1950s when the Alcohol Beverage Control Board would revoke a bar, uh, bar's license if same-sex couples were allowed to so much place an arm around one another. Uh, terrified still of having their liquor licenses pulled, many bar owners continued to enforce the taboo throughout the 1960s, but gay militants now proclaim such rules to be discriminatory. Our bar shouldn't be any harder for us than a head, uh, on us than the heterosexual bars on, are on their customers. And I have been to straight bars where they almost had sex on tabletops, observed the Reverend Troy Perry. The Gay Liberation Front took on uh, the uh, famous West Hollywood bar, The Farm. The farm's proprietor, Eddie Nash, a Lebanese immigrant born Adele Nasrallah, owned half a dozen other West Hollywood bars that attracted a gay clientele. He tried to enforce the no-touching rule rigorously, even though on any week night, the farm would be packed with more than 500 people hip to groin. One gay liberation front activist made an appointment to confront the farm's manager. I explained to him that his no-touching policy uh, was trampling on the civil rights of the very people who made his business possible. He said to me, you don't know who you're dealing with. And with that, he put his thumb down on the desk and twisted it as though he was crushing an ant. The activist, frightened but furious, said he conjured up his nerve and raised the threat. You don't know who you're dealing with. We'll bomb your bars. 
And I want to thank the performers who helped bring a bit of this to light uh, tonight, and uh, the charming and talented Trevor Healy for him seeing this. There are too many celebrities here in the audience to uh, uh, mention, uh, not all of whom even got interviewed. Uh, everyone who's gay in Los Angeles I had hoped to interview originally. Uh, <laughs> just too many. <laughs> but I, I'd like a show of hands of anyone who I did interview. Great. Okay, and I want all of all of the people who are raising their hands to sign uh, my copy of the book. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I I really want to thank everyone. So many people gave so much time and opened up uh, often not the best memories uh, uh, from uh, struggles gone by, and uh, sometimes they only got a line. Sometimes they didn't even get a line. But everyone gave incredibly important context to this project. There's a wonderful place in Amsterdam called the Homo Monument, which honors thousands uh, who were lost to uh, fascism in uh, 1930s Germany. Um, I sometimes thought of that while writing this, that it, it had a quality of a memorial for me. Uh, in my 30 years in Los Angeles, I have lost uh, so many friends, uh, having written about the 1950s generation and having lived in the 1980s generation. Uh, and so many lives and love stories and friendship stories and acts of bravery and brilliance are just lost whenever we lose an individual. So the motive to, to uh, do this was powerful. And, and the task really required looking at a Los Angeles that was uh, long gone before my own personal memory. Uh, this uh, book goes from uh, uh, really picks up a trail in the 1880s and goes up to uh, 2005. But the earliest trace that we found was actually 1540, uh, which is probably the earliest trace of a, a gay person in uh, the U.S. at all. It was uh, recorded and sent to Spain by a Spanish explorer named Alarcón, who uh, noticed a Quetzal Indian man wearing the clothes of the women of the tribe, which was an honorable tradition among the first Americans, which uh, helped get them unfortunately wiped out. Um, but it was part, and it was the first part of what it was to be gay in LA. Um, my writing partner, Lillian, and I had hoped that we would find enough material prior to 1930 to fill one small introductory chapter, and we found so much that we could not fit it in. It became one of the longest chapters in the book, and that was the syndrome with just about every chapter in this. We wound up uh, often saying that we could write a book nearly about every single decade, and certainly the last three decades would each be a three or four volume set. Uh, and every, uh, everyone who's been in the movement is nodding their heads at that. Um, we had to uh, pick and choose and attempt to create a uh, representation, a balance, to evoke some flavor, uh, uh, to reflect the most diverse city in the world in a way that it uh, often has not been uh, reflected, and more than anything else, to tell an untold story. So there are a few things that I'll, I'll uh, mention about why it was untold. Um, the, the pervasive war against gay people is Hard to get your head around if you didn't live through it. Uh, there was a jury instruction that I found from around 1888 from a Los Angeles judge, which talked about uh, a trial for what was called the infamous crime against nature, which is how any intimacy between two men was described. And it was always tried as an assault charge. And the judge instructed the jury that even if the assaulted party consented to the assault, it was still a felonious assault. That was the mentality of that. Um, the story of the mule of Glendora uh, was also found in the LA County Court Records, which uh, described that the full uh, wording of the statute of the crime against nature was that it was the infamous crime against nature against man or any animal. Enter the mule of Glendora. Someone actually was charged with committing the uh, crime against nature uh, on a mule and convicted. Um, the, uh, there is a lot of common knowledge in every generation that gets forgotten due to the sheer volume of time and certain agreements simply not to discuss certain things. 
There was a, a, an annual event in the last decade of the last century called the La Fiesta. They still kind of have a similar thing in Santa Barbara. In LA, it was very clearly modeled on Mardi Gras with all the implications of Mardi Gras. And there was so much uh, cross-dressing going on during La Fiesta that after a few years of uh, these events, there was a law you know, written after a real hounding campaign by the uh, uh, churches in the city so that the LA City Council passed a law for the first time banning the uh, drag among men and women, uh, which was uh, the law that became the, the masquerading law. Um, and in this city, just like Washington, D.C. has its political uh, main industry, we have our own main industry of uh, the entertainment industry, the successful double lives of Hollywood still uh, allowed for a gay life, albeit an underground and not so political one, and is very metaphorical for L.A. for a long time. Uh, the uh, public appearances and very different private realities had a huge impact on the way everybody lived here. Uh, those stories are now beginning to just spill out of uh, old closets, but uh, that enforced uh, code of silence uh, really made an impact on this town. We were faced with how do you define gay and how do you define LA, both of which are uh, big challenges, especially going back in time. Um, uh, first, L.A. used to be Mexico, um, and uh, before that it was Indian, and uh, as, as people are understanding today, uh, there is now a, a, a sort of a completion of a circle after uh, uh, really uh, 150 years of uh, a kind of a whiteness and uh, uptightness, um, but uh, that was a a major aspect of, of our uh, looking into the past as it as it impacts on the present. Geographically, we included a, a liberal stretch of Southern California, certainly down to Long Beach, which deserves a book of its own uh, for its own fabulous, distinguished gay history. Malibu, the valley, the beaches, the hills. Uh, West Hollywood, which is always the focal point on the news, but as, as we all know, especially those of us here in Silver Lake, it's much more than that. Um, defining uh, gay is very tough for the past. Uh, the t-shirts all mean something that people were wearing. Uh, social favorite or the sashes, uh, Malcolm explained, and also the term pervert, uh, professional perverted sexualist. These came from a real struggle uh, with a culture that was determined not to speak the word, but to somehow control the behavior in the population. Um, Hollywood reject is a term that was used as part of the uh, LAPD war against gay men. Uh, uh, officers who got into the vice squad, who would regularly go on a detail to entrap as many men as possible in one night's work, were chosen because they were so handsome they could be actors, but they couldn't really act, so they were called Hollywood rejects. But they, they were trained to dress and act as gay. Um, and uh, uh, this is uh, a term that anyone of a certain age will know with a terrible chill. 647A is the code under which gay men were arrested uh, for uh, lewd vagrancy or vag lewd. Uh, it's a, like I say, it's a term that really uh, uh, sends a chill down any, any, any spine that's old enough to uh, have had many friends, as Malcolm mentioned, who were, who were uh, had just tens of thousands of lives were destroyed. One of the things that was a real shocking discovery was that the LAPD boasted in the late 40s that they had a list of 10,000 registered sex offenders by which they meant just ordinary gay men. Uh, in the city of LA. Uh, the um, reason for, for going into this, aside from you know, what we described at the beginning, as Corey uh, uh, mentioned in his reading, about so much just going unrecorded. Um, and, and you know, I, I don't think that story about the 59 uh, uh, altercation ever would have seen print if, if I hadn't happened to get John Reggie to, to just mention it. Um, the, uh, um, 
an amount of firsts that have happened in LA have never been given proper credit. And it's, it's puzzled people for decades and decades. The, the uh, generation of the 1950s, the homophile generation, that did extraordinary work, they would just kind of, you know, groan and say what else is new in New York and San Francisco get all this attention and we did this all in LA so much earlier. But we really did. The Mattachine Society was the first national gay organization. It was founded in uh, 1950 uh, in Silver Lake. Uh, one magazine grew out of that, was seen on every newsstand across the country, and wound up triggering the first Supreme Court decision about homosexuality in the affirmative. They overturned a lower court ruling making it uh, no longer obscene and illegal to mail anything that simply discussed the subject issues of gay life, uh, you know, and without pictures in one magazine even. Uh, it was very demure. Uh, uh, Metropolitan Community, Community Church at a, began at a time when uh, almost all gay people were logically turning their back on the church, and Troy Perry here in LA had the foresight to see that eventually that wasn't quite going to uh, uh, serve the needs of the community, and he began what became the largest uh, uh, LGBT religious organization in the world. Um, the Advocate started here in 1967. All of these, these national and internationally uh, impactful organizations started uh, in LA before Stonewall. Um, and a couple of other things just to mention. The uh, Black Cat uh, was a bar uh, on Sunset Boulevard not far from here. There was a huge uh, uh, a brutal raid on New Year's <coughs> Day. It was New Year's Eve of 66 and the day of 67. Uh, there were several men who were convicted of uh, giving each other a New Year's kiss that lasted no more than 10 seconds, but they were all convicted of lewd conduct for that, and there was an enormous street demonstration lasting several weeks because of that. Uh, the Patch, uh, another LA bar, also uh, triggered a big riot, in, uh, not riot, but a demonstration in 1968 with uh, uh, the patrons confronting the police. And in those, in those times, you just didn't necessarily have everything fall into place for uh, media and legends to grow. And people have been extremely busy, almost nonstop, right, Ivy, with crisis after crisis for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years. Um, the uh, serious uh, accomplishments of, of our city are, are not all of it. We, we have uh, really had uh, a lot of fun with the, the cultural life, the personal life, uh, and the unflagging humor uh, that uh, you would find no matter how bad the oppre uh, oppression there, uh, that, that was going on. There was always, despite the worst of it, a party going on somewhere. Um, the uh, uh, Black humor in the face of that is just just fabulous. There's one saying from the 1950s when a, a cop and many of those Hollywood rejects would be spotted instantly for what they were, would walk into a gay bar where men could be arrested for touching. Uh, uh, you would often hear someone mutter, don't bruise the fruit, Mary. The fuzz is here. Um, yeah. So uh, the... Um, I guess the uh, final thing that I'd like to, to say before inviting everyone to ask a few questions and have a piece of cake is uh, that uh, uh, there are more stories to tell than can ever fit into one readable and saleable book. Uh, Anyone who's been involved in writing something like this knows that there's uh, most history books weigh so many pounds that when people pick them up in a bookstore, they put them down because they know how many hours will be required to sort of uh, slug through it. So we tried for a, a slim volume. It's uh, uh, actually written in a way that I'm sure is going to generate loads of complaints because of all the incredible stories we, we couldn't quite fit in and the uh, worthy people that we couldn't quite mention. And knowing firsthand uh, at least something about the generations that have been so brave and so smart and stood up and, and for so many years did it only out of principle, never for a salary, uh, and really wanted to uh, make sure that their stories were remembered and honored. Um, they'll never get 
the, the attention that they deserve and commemoration that they deserve. But uh, we lit a candle here, and that is uh, the most that we can hope for. So, um, and we, we are really hoping that this will be the beginning of more of this kind of urban history. It's, uh, uh, I was inspired years ago by a book called Gay New York, uh, which seemed to tell the entire gay story, but it was so specific to another city on another coast that's uh, its own very unique place, and, and LA is its own very unique place. So, um, this is, this, we are a part of the history of LA, and uh, I'm uh, very proud that Lillian and I were able to uh, uh, put this on, on uh, library shelves. And um, uh, I uh, would uh, be, at this point, really happy to answer any questions. Uh, please form any attacks in the form of a question. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if, if anyone has anything to ask. Hi, um, this is January 20th, um, Saturday, and we're at Stuart Timmons' apartment at 3052 Angus Street. Uh, Bob Herzog is going to do an interview, and Cheryl Revkin uh, is on camera. Looks great. Yeah, okay. Well, all volunteers were having, I'm really having a ball. I'm retired now, so I'm uh -huh. having a good time with people <laughs> like Cheryl to, to join with me. Um, and I'm not co-chairman. I got elected by default because it's not something to do with it. But uh, how leadership often happens. We're recording, by the way. So. Okay. 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 Well, then let's get down to business. Okay, Stuart, um, how long have you lived here in Silver Lake? I lived in Silver Lake since about 1984. And where did you come from? Uh, I, came, I grew up in Northern California in uh, the East Bay, a town called Lafayette. And I um, came to go to UCLA in the fall of 1976. Wound up uh, exploring a little bit on this side of town while I was still a student. But uh, within a couple of years of graduating, uh, I graduated in 81. I just gravitated over to Silver Lake and found a little place. Great. And uh, would you tell us how old you are? <laughs> I'm uh, 50 last Sunday. Just oh, okay. so um, we're going to get to what you do professionally, but I wanted you to tell us a little bit about your experiences here in Silver Lake, um, the things you like to do, uh, the pastimes you have, um, if you're involved with any other organizations in Silver Lake, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, I haven't uh, been. Uh, too active in any specific organizations uh, that are Silver Lake related. There was a campaign that I'd be glad to talk about involving the so-called Silver Lake 40 uh, proposed construction right here off of Angus Street on a little unnamed alley. Uh, but uh, when I was at, uh, at UCLA, I got involved in uh, a brand new thing that had just started, which was a gay student newspaper. It may have been the first gay student newspaper anywhere that sprouted up in around 1979 at UCLA. And though I had a, a, a great opportunity, I was a film and television major there uh, on campus, I was so excited by this real historic uh, turning point in time where there had been nothing in terms of uh, community press, uh, by and large, very little public dialogue, and to be able to start writing about these issues in many ways for the first time, certainly from a student perspective, got me fired up. So I got involved in uh, writing, got recruited to write for a paper called San Diego Update that was also a gay community paper because at that point there was no gay paper in Los Angeles except for uh, the, the UCLA campus paper which was a little campus paper. So uh, I began to write for this San Diego gay paper that had LA distribution and within a few years, I uh, was offered an opportunity to write a biography of uh, an activist from Silver Lake named Harry Hay, who was considered the founder of the gay movement for having started a, a group in 1950 called the Mattachine Society. 
and became very interested in history and in uh, writing. So I became a writer and something of a historian. Excellent. And uh, as long as we're on this subject, which obviously is, is our reason for being here, why don't you tell us in general about your new book, starting with the title and your co-author, and then I'd like to hear some more specific uh, information about the gay movement in, in Silver Lake. Sure. Uh, the book is called Gay LA, A History of uh, Sexual Outlaws, Power Politics, and Lipstick Lesbians. It uh, is co-authored between myself and Lillian Faderman, and uh, it is a very sweeping uh, kind of a city history from the uh, until now untold uh, gay and lesbian point of view. It's a very carefully co-gender book, and it spans around 1880. Uh, up to 2005. It was amazing how much of a trail we were able to pick up with a lot of archival research. And then we, we both interviewed about 150 people apiece for the book uh, from all over Southern California, but there was a, a lot of interesting stuff in Silver Lake, so I'll tell you a little bit of, about that. Uh, certainly all gay life until the movement was very clandestine. Uh, of necessity, so it was illegal to uh, be anything other than a married person uh, involved with the missionary position. And uh, it, you know, it's hard for people to now understand that you could be sent to prison for uh, uh, things like adultery and things like doing sex acts that weren't uh, uh, for the purpose of making a baby. Uh, but you could, and there was um, uh, a tremendous underground society, at least from the turn of the century, uh, that certainly included uh, Silver Lake as part of LA. And by the time the movie industry kicked up in the late teens and through the 20s, uh, Silver Lake became something of a center. The Max Senate studio was here, and um, there's one account, which we mention in our book, of um, an actor who says that he had an um, uh, ongoing affair with Max Sennett, uh, which was so improbable to most people that it, it, uh, it's been sort of dismissed. But this was an actor who had a uh, name Ralph Graves, no reason to lie, but everyone had everything to lose in those days. Well, also, let's make a point of reference if I made the humor, my mother thought Luke Marachi just had not found the right one. Right. That's the kind of atmosphere that was happening in the 50s and sure. 60s and later. And yeah, and, and long before. And the idea that theater people were a little disreputable and always bohemians and, you know, don't put your daughter on the stage and all of that certainly translated into Hollywood for a while. But the difference is that. Uh, Theater people are kind of local apparitions on a stage, but somehow film personalities are more real. So even though there's always been a tremendous gay and lesbian population within and around the film industry, there has been a stronger code of silence and a bigger sort of closet. Uh, people can get away with a lot within uh, the kind of confines of that state of mind called Hollywood. There was always room for people to be different, but not for room for, not room for people to be so out and open about it. Wasn't it true that back in the 20s there you could be more open if you were theatrical or an actor involved in that? And then when the Hays Code came along in the 30s, it shut down all of that well, uh, liberal... You, yeah, you, you, there was definitely a... Uh, uh, a sort of a pre-liberation surge, you could say, with uh, uh, a lot of uh, pushing the edge of social acceptance. There was actually something around 1930 that was very much coming out of the speakeasy culture, because uh, uh, prohibition was lifted, I think, in 31, 
and uh, you had uh, underground bars where everything was illegal. It was illegal to be, it was straight people for all those years of prohibition had the same experience gay people wound up having for years afterwards, that they were in illegal, clandestine circumstances, so they had to form a network, they had to be kind of protective of one another, and, you know, cut loose and have fun. So there was something known as the pansy craze around the 30s where some, uh, it was actually a place called the Pansy Club in Manhattan and several of the headliners who would, were men who would wear rouge and wave a big silk handkerchief and be really outrageous and you know pretty, pretty damn queer up on stage as a persona uh, and a very entertaining one and they would have reviews called Boys Will Be Girls and things like that. Several of those entertainers came out to Los Angeles and th th there were crackdowns as this kind of stuff came up in various cities. There was a crackdown in New York, several, a guy named Jean Melan came out to, to LA, had a club uh, on Hollywood Boulevard for a while, a guy named Ray Bourbon, who was um, an incredible LA character and a real female impersonator, also came out here for a while and then the heat came on in this town and they went up to San Francisco. But uh, a number of those uh, bars started up uh, where you had um, uh, the presence of gay people. And uh, they, they were not gay bars as we know them, but from the beginning of bars, you had uh, places where it would become like a gay hangout. It was, wasn't necessarily mentioned, but anyone who had eyes to see would see it. They were called clubs, I believe, and they, they, the door was always in the back. Very often, yeah. Very so you often. could sneak down the alley from the cab or from your parking place and go in the back door. And right. It was called a club because it was a club. It was a place for gay men and lesbians in, in their own bars, usually not together, but often, to gather. Yeah. And it was a club of a sort, and of course it was wild and fun. And yeah, well, and, and that was a speakeasy model. Uh, there, there were some that were actual bars where, because uh, I've heard of clubs like that where they would just rent a place and, and, and start some up. There were bars as well that were established bars that might not be doing any business where the gays would just start to gravitate and the business would pick up. And then after a few months, the cops might notice it and, and warn the bar owner that he'd lose his liquor license. But it was always defensive. The, the, the other thing about places that wound up becoming gay type bars was they almost always uh, painted the windows black or didn't have any windows because no one wanted to be seen on this, uh, off the street and recognized uh, in a place. And, and like you say, a back entrance would protect people from, uh, from being recognized going into a place like that. Well, what, the, oh, excuse me, what's the first one that you know of in Silver Lake, the uh, just, first gay club? I was just or going there. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I was going to say while we're on the subject of I'm bars, sorry. let's talk about Silver Lake bars. I have some experience and I'm sure you do. Yeah, so. I, I will. You know, my, my personal is from the 1980s um, and on. And, uh, um, I know the uh, there's a place uh, that's still a, a gay bar on Hyperion. It's now called The Other Side. It uh, was famously the Toy Tiger for a long time. Houston's. Uh, Houston's, yeah, bars. Rounds, Daddy's, and that uh, was originally called Patino's, uh, named for uh, Pat and Tino, who were lovers, who, uh, who had it. And uh, there's a great documentary on it made by a woman named Jane Cantillon uh, that I consulted for. Um, and well, these, that was what we would call a gentleman's bar. Um, yeah. You usually got dressed up to go to the bar. There was a big piano bar um, with an entertainer, a, a change bucket on the piano. Um, the crowd was usually more mature. Yeah. But there were also other bars in Silver Lake that catered to different tastes. Leather bars, um, cowboy bars, college boy bars, S&M bars. I can think of the Detour, which was at Sunset Junction, right. which was there for years and years. And uh, one of my personal hangouts every weekend. And of course, during Sunset Junction, the initial years, 20 years ago, that was the focal point. Right. And then down the street was Lay Bar, which was called something else then. There were dance bars. And then now the place called Cliffside 
was one of the later bars that came along and uh, it had uh, the, the landscaping going up the back and it was a gay bar for a long time. The Jungle. Dance place. It was called the Jungle. Jungle. And, and it became a lesbian uh, bar called uh, Flamingo. Flamingo. Right. And then okay. that went away and now it's a chic restaurant. Cliff's right. Edge, actually. Right. Yeah. Owned by Dana Hollister. Right. Yeah, yeah. We, we used to call Flamingos Flamingos. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it had a little dance floor inside. It was like a little teeny postage stamp disco floor uh, from the days when that was, was really popular. There for a while, it was fun because actually gay men and lesbians who usually separate themselves from each other all got together in the same place right. for about, about right. a year and a half. Right, 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 right. exactly. And, uh, Woody's on uh, Woody's Hyperion. It was called on Hyperion Avenue. It was pool tables. Very, very, very old school bar Dancing. that yeah. just turned over. Uh, still is a gay club now. MJ's. Um, and I, some guy I talked to told me about having been in a bar raid in Silver Lake at a place. I think it was called the Ram's Head. Uh, I've, I've been in several. Yeah. Uh, usually the fire department, but occasionally LAPD, and it was pure intimidation. Yeah. They didn't ask anyone to leave as right. if it were too crowded right. and rules were being broken. Five or six officers would come in either from LAPD or the fire department with their hands on their pistols, their revolvers, sheathed but nevertheless there with flashlights shining them in your eyes right. and shining them down at your pants, at your crotch, at the floor, right. looking for some sort of evidence to create a problem. Right. Oh yeah, there's one story that's uh, quite uh, well known by my, my uh, co-author uh, was told this by a woman who had been dancing at a lesbian club and I've heard the same thing from men's clubs that in places where you could dance and prior to the 70s it was really against the law for, for same-sex people to dance or even to touch casually on the shoulder or something. Uh, the owner would go in and shine a flashlight between dancing couples to make sure that they weren't touching because otherwise the bar owner could lose their liquor license. So, um, anyway, you asked about specific uh, history in, in, in Silver Lake. Yeah, the Mattachine Society was uh, a major piece of movement history. I mean, there's the social and cultural history, and then there's the more overt organizing. And the Mattachine Society was founded uh, on a beautiful uh, home uh, at the top of Cove Avenue, uh, right off of Apex, overlooking the lake, uh, which was at that point rented by Harry Hay, a man whose biography I wrote, who just died a few years ago. Um, he uh, was married at the time, like many gay people were, but knew that uh, it was his calling, really, uh, to organize what he called the androgynous minority. He'd been a lefty and actually a member of the Communist Party in LA, which was very big in the uh, uh, Silver Lake Echo Park area in uh, um, what he sometimes referred to as Holy Mount Moscow over... Uh, <laughs> uh, That's where uh, Cheryl lives. Yeah, yeah. Red, Red Hill. 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 <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, that was that was a term back in the 40s that they used, and and he had about a 10-year marriage in the 40s, and uh, uh, he was kind of heading for an emotional crack up, but, but started thinking in political terms about minorities, how to organize a minority, what a minority could do in terms of voting and buying and. Uh, having an impact on society, having some bargaining power with society, and it took that kind of radical vision. Uh, a couple of other radicals, a guy named Chuck Rowland, who had also been in the, uh, uh, in the party and had been a, a veteran of World War II, and um, Dale Jennings, who was a local Silver Lake guy and a screenwriter who became quite famous for writing uh, uh, one of the main John Wayne vehicles. Uh, and uh, Rudy Gernreich, who was Harry's lover at the time, who was a big fashion designer, about 10 years later in the 60s. Uh, they formed a committee, and uh, for a, a year and a half, almost two years, they couldn't get very far. They were trying to reach out to people. The very first proto version, prototype version, that Harry had started of the organization he called Bachelors Anonymous. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, someone built on that whole idea of Alcoholics Anonymous, and 
his thinking evolved pretty quickly, and they they took up the term mattachine because it um, it was an obscure term that, people, that that you could use in public without having to say homosexual or uh, uh, any word that would flag unwanted attention, and you could explain to people what it meant that there had been these troops of men who did folk dancing in medieval France, and they wore masks in public to hide their true identity. It was, it was a, a, an elaborate shishi kind of historical term that wound up being effective, and it took on. And one of their uh, co-founders, Dale Jennings, the writer, was arrested uh, in a, uh, uh, an entrapment situation at Echo Park uh, Lake and um, wound up um, being uh, um, tried and he fought the charges. Almost all gay men uh, made a plea bargain and they knew their careers would be wrecked and they knew that uh, uh, they just wouldn't win. No, you know that, that that the police would would lie, and that uh, the judge would not listen. And because there was a group, they had an opportunity to get a lawyer. It was a labor lawyer, straight guy, but he was uh, uh, incensed when he understood what was happening. And they they caught the cop in a lie on the stand and the judge kicked the case. So that the organization became nationwide and really for a good uh, 20 years before the famous Stonewall Uprising in New York in 1969, out of LA there had been a whole mechanism for establishing newsletters, a national network of communication, there have been a few national conferences for gay rights. Uh, there's this one called Nacho, the uh, uh, North American uh, Council of Homophile Organizations, <laughs> uh, and uh, and they had several of these of these conferences. So so there, there was a lot going on. Uh, there was an organization that uh, started up in um, uh, around '66 that was uh, around Hollywood and Silver Lake called Pride which stood for personal rights and defense and education. And it had a glorious vision. They actually said in the, in the uh, mid-60s that they were going to start a gay community services center and have employment counseling and psychological counseling and every, everything that, that exists today. But in fighting and, and uh, uh, pressure and tension tore the organization apart, the thing that survived out of that was their newsletter, the Pride Newsletter which was purchased for one dollar by a guy who used the name Dick Michaels and that's what became the advocate. And um, yeah, I can hold that, that up. Yeah. Yes. yes, here's the advocate. Right. Uh, is it focused? Here, uh, let me go in a little more. There we go. That's it, good. it should self-focus. Yeah, there, there we go. Yeah. That was purchased for one dollar. The first twenty-five thing. cents. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That was the the uh, business the was Asking purchased. Price. Price. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, right. The the um, uh, the the whole the whole the rights to this newsletter name, the Advocate, were, were purchased for one dollar, and we just it recently sold for I don't know how many millions of dollars, but uh, it's sold for for huge amounts of money now. It's it's just kind of astonishing and. Um, the uh, um, Advocate was, was begun as a newspaper uh, in nearby Los Feliz at ABC Studio. There was a typing pool which had mostly gay guys in it. And uh, several of them um, were inducted into uh, spending their overtime and weekends working on uh, this newsletter and uh, uh, cranking it out on ABC's typewriters and cranking it out on their uh, copy machines. So it originated in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Silver Lake. Right, right absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I didn't know that. Right, right. Okay. Shame on me. Ah, <laughs> you do know about the famous Black Cat Raid, right? Tell me about it. Uh, that was uh, uh, an, an incredible and enormous uh, public demonstration against police brutality. It, it started uh, New Year's Eve of 1966 and really was the very first, maybe, you know, minute of 1967. Um, the Black Cat was a bar on Sunset. It later became Tabasco's 
and uh, now I think it's, I'm not even sure what it's called, whether it's called Basco's or La Barcito or, or one of those. It's right next to the laundromat. If you look La Bar, I think La Bar. Okay. So it's a uh, sunset near uh, the Hyperion. Hyperion, right, right, right. Yeah, okay. Hyperion. In so the, the, the laundromat, mm -hmm. right adjacent mm -hmm. to it, with the parking lot. Chamber mm -hmm. Commerce. Mm -hmm. And and at some point, when if, if you're ever out there, uh, there's a marquee that says La Bar. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. And at the top of it, it's painted white. You'll see a white circle up on top of it. You look closely you'll see the sort of uh, relief of a black cat, like Felix the Cat. It's the original black cat sign. So um, I need to work with some organization to try to get that preserved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really historic, because what happened was the, um, this area was, uh, uh, it's always been between the Northeast Police Station and the Rampart Police Station. That part of Silver Lake was uh, being looked at by the Rampart Station and uh, cracking down on so-called vice and going into gay bars with your hands on your guns and all of that was a big sort of dog and pony show of uh, elected officials, the mayors, the councilmen, everyone who was running for mayor to clean up vice, to show that they were doing something to preserve our morals in the American way. <coughs> so some of the roughest <clears throat> and most brutal uh, raids came out of the uh, Rampart Division and <clears throat> a, uh, uh, this bar, uh, the Black Cat, was having its New Year's Eve party that night, the very end of 1966. And at the stroke of midnight, as there was a, an all-girl band singing Old Lang Syne to a doo-wop beat and there were balloons and streamers and old Christmas decorations glittering, uh, these cops just burst in and they saw that there were several men who were kissing Happy New Year. And ultimately several of these men were convicted for kissing up to 10 seconds. That was a lewd conduct charge, an outrage against public morals. And the DA was begged in the name of common sense to drop this. There were volunteer lawyers who were even straight ACLU type lawyers who uh, uh, were astonished by how outrageous this prosecution was. But they, they, they got this through. But the raid itself was really the outrage. Uh, because one bartender was beaten so badly his uh, spleen had to be removed. Uh, there was another one who I believe was put in the hospital. There was a, a woman who owned a bar across the street called Faces. She was where some of the people ran for cover into this other bar and they were pursued by the police and beaten up and this woman who owned a gay bar was also beaten with billy clubs. So there was a, a really horrendous level of violence and because it was the 60s and the climate of the times, which was building up so much counterculture, uh, organizational activity, there was coalition of uh, uh, radicals that uh, uh, seized on this uh, incident to uh, publicize an anti-police day of protest. They actually had several weekends of protest in a row. And uh, this happened New Year's Day, really, of 67. Within a month, they had organized and they had uh, uh, dozens and dozens of people in front of the Black Cat during weekends handing out thousands and thousands of pieces of literature. There are photographs I've seen of people uh, holding up signs saying, uh, you know, stop blue fascism, referring to the blue police uniforms. and. Uh, uh, stop raiding our bars, and uh, but it was a coalition with uh, uh, you know straight people and and uh, hippie type organizers, you know youth culture, uh, uh, anti-war and anti-police abuse and anti-racist uh, uh, um, activists trying to reform the LAPD. Uh, so there was a real historic. Uh, uh, 
anti-police event around a gay bar at, right in Silver Lake in 1967 that for years and years people in Silver Lake said they just didn't understand how New York and Stonewall got all the attention that so much had happened here from the 50s uh, with all of the organizing. Do you think it had anything to do with, with our major publications? I think we had two newspapers back then being part of the establishment and part of the system and not reporting things like perhaps the New York Times would or the New York Post or even the uh, Washington Post. Uh, that's a great question that would require some real, you know, looking at analysis. Uh, I think the real problem lay in the nature of the city of LA itself. New York and San Francisco are geographically concentrated cities with often one big gay district. LA is so huge that it's got multiple gay districts. There was Silver Lake and West Hollywood and up and down most of the beaches. Santa Monica. Yeah, Santa Monica, Venice, uh, Long Beach, uh, Manhattan Beach, you know, there's you know, there, there, there are places all over the place. Mount Washington has, has long had uh, a gay enclave, so uh, you, you have it, and of course Hollywood and the Hollywood Hills. So, you know, there's, there's a dozen or so gay neighborhoods around L.A., so therefore there hadn't been so much of one center. Uh, and and that's, that's part of... of uh, that's part of the whole problem we have here with a United City. We, we right. covered 450 square miles right. plus. Right, right. And uh, Manhattan is, what, uh, 106 or something? Yeah, so, uh, much smaller. I mean, New York and its five boroughs. So it's much smaller, and I think that that had a lot to do with it. And also, the Silver Lake became a good place to hide out. Right. Because it wasn't flamboyant, it wasn't in the spotlight like West Hollywood was, and a lot of couples moved here to have a home. Right. Away from the partying and the parades and the notoriety. Yeah, and I think, you know, there, there are two implications of what you just say there. One is for people who were at all in the public eye, uh, you could have a quiet life and, uh, and sort of escape all of that public scrutiny if you didn't live on the west side or in West Hollywood. Um, and the uh, um, gay culture itself can get uh, a bit frenetic and, uh, uh <laughs> you know, with the, the, the pressure to be out and about all the time in a, in a sort of a scene instead of in more of a life. And then last but not least, it's the great charm of Silver Lake that there was, uh, you know, ironically, a certain um, uh, boycotting of it or fear of it by a lot of the uh, successful money people because they worried about crime, they had certain racist uh, uh, images about it being dangerous to be in Silver Lake, you know, in the day, let alone at dark. And that ironically helped keep the balance of reasonable rents and it, it preserved the little, you know, secret treasure of what Silver Lake uh, was and, you know, still is, although it seems to be undergoing a, <laughs> such a change so fast. But, uh, it, it was a wonderful sort of, you know, poor man's paradise here for, for such a long time. And I remember when I first came over here for a Sunset Junction Street Fair, and it was either 79 or 80, I think it was the first one. And it was really just uh, this buzz. People were talking about how there could be a gay neighborhood, and there could be an interesting place to be where you would, you know, find friends and not be... Uh, uh, an, an, an exile in a straight neighborhood, uh, but it wasn't West Hollywood. It wasn't quite so... Well, what was, Stuart, if I may, what I remember about the first two or three, four or five Sunset Junction fairs was that you would have three or four guys with their arms around each other walking down the street, a couple of lesbian couples, and then there'd be the Latinos with their, with their babies and the Anglos with their babies and their, and their strollers. Right. And, uh, the entertainment was mixed and everyone was comfortable together and mm -hmm. I think when people saw that from different parts of the city and other parts of the country right. they thought, plus our climate, right. I want to live there, I've, I'll feel comfortable there and I think we had a lot of influx of people based on that. Still do? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, it was, it was very much a picture of, of a diversity that had a certain warmth to it. Um, and, uh, you know, there was an article in the LA Times from right around 79, 80, talking about how Silver Lake was becoming the new West Hollywood simply because it was more affordable. You have these beautiful houses that were built in the teens and 20s and 30s that you could get for so much less than any place on the West Side. And uh, um, so, yeah, all, all, all of those things. And then something that keeps coming up in, in our interviews, you say, well, what is, you really, what is the thing you really enjoy about Silver Lake? What, what is your favorite landmark? And everyone says, well, the lake. Uh -huh. I mean, we live around a lake. It's a man-made lake. It's a yeah. reservoir. But uh, I walk around it from time to time, and it's like being out in the country. The San Gabriel Mountains to the yeah. north, downtown Los Angeles, if you look carefully over to the east, and uh, it's like being out in the open air. And it's yeah. beautiful. It's an escape from the confines of the urban area. Well, it created a little microclimate where you would have, you know, the 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 breeze off the water plus you would just have that aesthetic there's something really profound about living around water and uh, there used to be where it's I, this area I now call Gilgans Island it's uh, it's over behind the Mayfair uh, around Ettrick um, the, it, it's been a big re-landscape with an underground reservoir but it used to be another man-made reservoir and it was another kind of miniature just beautiful little place and uh, you know, a, a good friend of mine had a cheap apartment there that was just, just incredibly lovely. Um, but yeah, I, I, the, the the physical uh, beauty of the place is, is just wonderful. And I remember many times when I was first driving over here, I'd be struck by those little ridges of palms, the top of the hills, those little you know. Uh, uh, Pom pom, top of the palm trees that uh, were just just so charming. We should mention that the palm trees. We have a lot of mostly uh, imported foliage. We have a few California oaks uh, in the area, but a lot of palm trees. And there can be a time when you can be driving around and there's a palm tree. Every time you look out your car window, yeah. it's framed by palm trees. Yeah, yeah, it's and unique. also those those. The ones on, on tops of uh, some of the hills, which just create this very unusual and sort of whimsical uh, and graceful little uh, uh, sort of a frame to the whole uh, to the whole area. So there's there's a there's a real charm to this place. Sure. Okay. Wait. Okay. Go on. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about some of the bars because it's pertinent to not only the, the gay activist movement but to the texture and spirit of, of Silver Lake. Um, Cheryl brought up several bars that uh, I'm familiar with and perhaps you are too. Uh, Cuffs for one. Sure, yeah. Cuffs uh, was a delightful little uh, uh, rat hole of a bar. Uh, <laughs> And, um, with it, a balcony. Uh, yeah, with a with a balcony, uh, so you could make the grand tour. And uh, um, it was always, you know, was, people joke that it was illuminated by one single uh, little red Christmas light. I think that was right. <laughs> and uh, so you could barely see. It was a a touchy feely place. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, it it got raided increasingly and ultimately lost its license and and they uh, closed it down. But uh, it was uh, a really happening scene for a long time, all through the eighties and probably back to the seventies. Raided uh, more currently for what exactly? Uh, it was raided for whatever they could get it on. Uh, they usually came in. It was about being. Too many people in the space. Yeah, so sometimes. Yeah, some. Yeah, right. There would be, you know, fire safety violations. There would be, uh, you know, you could you could get popped for serving alcohol to a uh, uh, an inebriated person, and if there was any sexual activity going on in the bar. And by touchy feely, I meant gropey. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that you kind didn't of mean thing. That in a spiritual sense. No, either. that kind of thing, you know, was not unknown there uh, at certain times. So okay. um, all of that uh, uh, 
kind of piled up, but there were real allegations. There were actually some big meetings about this, that the bars in West Hollywood, which were not in the city of L.A., would hardly ever get raided or shut down, no matter what happened there. But the bars in Silver Lake, like Cuffs, mm -hmm. which had more people of color and more working class people, would tend to get raided more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was, you know, this real history of some real political tension around this. Stuff. Let's add to that bar the one way on Hoover. The one way was a real legendary bar. They uh, called themselves uh, L.A.'s most notorious leather bar. It was there certainly in the heyday of the 70s and the sort of pre-AIDS days. And it closed sometime in the early to mid-80s. Uh, it's now a, uh, an evangelista church. Right, right and, uh, amazing, an evangelical church. Evangelical, well, thank you. All, all, kinds of, uh, <laughs> all kinds of spirituality has taken place. I wonder there. how they clean the spirits out of that place. <laughs> yeah, well, with a lot of, with a lot of ammonia, I'm well, sure. The crosses, but too. There's, there's a real interesting, I mean, you know, the, the, the one way actually had a, a little uh, back patio. Then they would open the door to that during full moons, and people would carry on wildly there. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about the one way that was really remarkable was that it was uh, known for its music. There were a couple of DJs, mostly a guy named Jim Van Tyne, uh, Richard Escarcega was another one, and they. This was during the era of sort of disco domination. You would go on, into almost any bar, certainly any place in West Hollywood, and it was that boom, 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 disco all the time. You couldn't get away from it. It was kind of this, you know, soda pop, bubblegum beat. And uh, the one way had European pop and all kinds of new sounds that you just didn't hear anywhere And ethereal. Else. Yeah. Suited the atmosphere. Right, right. And, and so there was a... There was this appeal about that place, and it was sort of emblematic of Silver Lake, that uh, in West Hollywood, which was the official gay ghetto, it was really increasingly conformist. You couldn't necessarily be yourself if you didn't fit into a certain kind of tight mold. Silver Lake and the One Way offered a lot more freedom, at least symbolized by the freedom of music. And the guys who were the uh, DJs there, who were very creative young guys in their 20s, started uh, holding Sunday afternoon parties once a month called theoretical parties. And the theoreticals, I, I, I don't have them immediately, but I have some flyers. I can maybe uh, email you some and you can mm -hmm. pop them in. Uh, but they were, you know, a punk edged performance art early experimental kind of social scene where they wound up uh, having a cross-section of a mailing list with a lot of artists, a lot of straight people, a lot of the regular leather guys, a lot of the art gay guys, uh, just a wonderfully unpredictable mix that just seemed to equal all kinds of freedom. Uh, it was the first time I ever saw Nina Hagen in person. She was just hanging out there, and I think she performed uh, one night. Uh, the uh, infamous Edie the Egg Lady from John Waters Films had moved from Baltimore to Los Angeles and was running a thrift shop, and Van Tyne got her to start coming up and doing some of her songs, and, and she was this camp character. Uh, a guy who was this sort of hairy, beefy, bald guy who called himself Dainty Adoro Hair would come out in a tutu and sing My Heart Belongs to Daddy and other ridiculous things, but just hilariously funny. Joanna Wint, uh, who became quite notorious and, and famous as a uh, performance artist, uh, she, she did a lot of her early work at, at those theoretical parties. They eventually spread beyond that bar, but it, it left a real incredible legacy. So I wanted to just mention, mention that. I'm going to get back to a couple of other bars here, but before we leave it out, it was a drawing place for many guys from Silver Lake, from Hollywood, from all over the place. It was a bar now called Zone, which is on the corner of, right behind the mobile station in Vermont, and uh, Melrose. Yeah. A few blocks technically from the Silver Lake border, but nonetheless part of the, the gay life, on especially on weekends and well, weeknights, well, any time. <laughs> now, was that the one with an incredible mural in it? 
Um, I don't know. It was not originally called the zone. It, that's what it's called now. It was, it was called the... It was, um, was it called the zoo? That was down further. Okay. That was down by... Um, down on, on Melrose further. That was a whole little area that was blooming yeah. in the 70s right. and the 80s, too. Right. There were right. gay right. Rest, two gay restaurants right. and a couple of bars, but right. I think we should leave that to Hollywood because now we call it East Hollywood, but right. we went there. Yeah. We yeah. were pleased to have restaurants that were dedicated to gay men. Right. Where the, the owners were gay, the waiters were gay, everyone in there was gay, we could flirt, we could get decent food at a fair price, and right. we could get wine and liquor very right. often. So right. we had our own places to go. Right, right, right. exactly, exactly. And there were the, uh, the, the, the growing tradition of uh, gay brunches. Uh, <laughs> and you would often have guys still wearing their leather outfits and down for brunch. It's just still a Still up all night. Yeah, maybe just a word about the Silver Lake Lounge since it's, it was sure. mainly the Latino gay scene there, maybe not much in English going on there. Well, the there, there were a, a number of gay Latino bars in mm -hmm. Silver Lake. Mm -hmm. There was uh, uh, on both sides of that little strip right mm -hmm. around there, I think there was one called Mina Yarit Bar mm -hmm. that was uh, mm -hmm. also pretty much a gay Latino bar. And uh, uh, the Silver Lake Lounge was famous for its drag shows for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you would, you know, was one of these places that smelled like a hundred years worth of cigarettes <laughs> and, uh, and spilled alcohol. And spilled alcohol and spilled God knows what. Whatever. But, uh, there was this little crappy stage and a little <laughs> dim spotlight, mm -hmm. and these uh, these drag queens with this just Latin force of a hurricane with mm -hmm. their wigs and their makeup and their sheer personality mm -hmm. would come out and lip sync these numbers, mm -hmm. and uh, you know you'd have these. Um, uh, wild, wild, uh, the audiences would be absolutely spellbound during this. I mean, they, they really knew how to focus attention, and then there'd be an eruption of screams and cheers and applause. And uh, there was another bar that had a bigger stage and was a little more professional called the Plaza mm -hmm. in Hollywood, uh, I think on Highland or La Brea. But, um, uh, the Silver Lake Lounge, you know, was sort of like it's the, uh, the little lab. It was uh, uh, it was the out of town tryouts for the big Hollywood leagues. So let's mention the Different Light Bookstore. Different Light Bookstore was really something um, extraordinary. It started here in the uh, around 1980. Uh, I used to work there uh, in the 80s and uh, early 90s. And um, I actually have a few things from it. I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll pull them up. Um, a different light. This is a different light book, Mar. Um, okay. The uh, different light was um, uh, run by these Canadian guys, um, Norman Larilla and uh, Richard Labonte and George Lee was the kind of out of towner uh, who would come back and forth who who financed it. Um, they did uh, all kinds of readings, celebrities, uh, who were thrilled to come there. William Burroughs came there, Allen Ginsberg, mm -hmm. Christopher Isherwood, mm -hmm. uh, to just this little neighborhood bookstore because it was, in many ways, the first of its kind. There was a gay bookstore in New York and uh, one in Philadelphia, but they were so caught up in the movement and in a rather rigid politic and a different light had a very inclusive and very cultural philosophy mm -hmm. and took off like gangbusters. They had a gay men's writing series called uh, Sundays at Seven and One mm -hmm. Sunday a Month. Uh, this whole new movement of gay writers would read these wonderful stories and it was preceded by the Lesbian Writers series, which was just this incredible phenomenon uh, started by Ann Bradley and later uh, taken on by Cynthia Corleone. Uh, they had community uh, people reading too. That's me. Uh, that's oh, me. Oh, that's you? Uh, yeah, oh my God. yeah, yeah, with hair. Uh, in, in, in more places than I have it now. Uh, <laughs> much more of it. Uh, but there was this little podium, Jim, James Carroll Pickett, who also worked there uh, and was a terrific local playwright, Silver Lake playwright. Uh, he was the coordinator of the thing, and they did a lot of theatrical readings. This is uh, this is a, a, a flyer for something called Warren, 
which was one of the very earliest AIDS plays oh. and uh, by Rebecca Ranson and uh, Ann Bradley uh, right here. She was one of the readers. David Stebbins and Joe Frazier uh, down here and Michael Kearns. Mm -hmm. They were all involved with, uh, mm -hmm. with this production and there were there really was this feeling of community theater. Another institution I'll mention just briefly, just a bit down the street from um, uh, the one way, was a place called Celebration Theater, which started by uh, a um, colleague, it was started by a colleague, uh, co-founder of the Madison Society, Chuck Rowland, in the 1980s, and he felt that the the answer to the struggling uh, gay community and all its institutions was to, to really get some culture out there that represented a deeper level of life than just mm -hmm. political rhetoric. That's another thing Silver Lake uh, started, and that, that's still going on. It's sort of been absorbed by the Gay and Lesbian Center, but it started here in Silver Lake. Yeah. Great. And, uh, okay. I don't know. You're not on yet. I'm recording now. Oh, okay, great. Um, was the first keep talking You're okay okay, okay. This, so do you want over. the location again yeah okay yeah where Griffith Park Boulevard runs into Sunset Boulevard was a little place in, around 1970 called the Gay Will Funky Shop it was the first fundraising effort of the Gay Community Services Center which is now a 30 million dollar a year organization but it started right here it was uh, created and rented by a guy named John Platania and um, this flyer by Bruce Rifle uh, talks about uh, uh, the idea of uh, recycling your junk uh, and uh, having your needs met uh, for furniture and raising money for the gay community. So that's kind of amazing. Down here is just a picture of the center, which was uh, originally down at Wilshire and Union, uh, not so far away. Um, there are a couple of mentions. These are uh, some of the, the very early advocate uh, um, uh, things and uh, issues. This is a, a store called That Look, which was uh, right uh, down on Hyperion, 2512 Hyperion Avenue. Uh, and um, the idea of, uh, uh, and this is 1967, the idea of gay businesses aside from the bars and the, the, uh, the fact that there really was a a community that had a bit going on uh, is is important to remember. Um, you know, it didn't didn't all start overnight. It didn't all start in one place. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I don't know why I marked that, but um, oh yeah, that's that again. Yeah. Uh, here is just just a, a, a commemoration of a gay bar raid uh, in Silver Lake. Uh, these um, these things just happened all the time. There are thousands and thousands of men who were uh, uh, arrested, and uh, many had their careers ruined if they were teachers or worked for the government. Uh, they often just had to change professions. Um, a couple of other just quick things. Uh, these three folks here, this is a group called Age of Consent. Uh, John Callahan, who lived right behind the Vista Theater, and uh, Thea Other and David I'm Hughes. Flare. I'm getting flair. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, uh, they started uh, the first uh, rap group that was made of uh, gay folks. There have recently been documentaries, this is around 82, uh, recently documentaries have talked about the new gay rap and completely ignored uh, this part of the history, but they, uh, they were very political and, and really incredibly talented. Um, these are some shots, these two, of the what I think may have been the first Sunset Junction yeah. Fair. That's mm -hmm. me again. This is uh, Maybe take it off. about 1980. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's okay. This yeah. is about 1980, and uh, uh, there was not that much to be to be had out there. Um, uh, not that many booths, a lot of open space. But as we were saying earlier, the idea of all these different kinds of people being out there uh, just really uh, made Silver Lake a very attractive place. Um, 
Let me show you one other thing. This is um, this is a uh, a prop from uh, uh, something that was called a Shakespeare travesty. There was a local guy in Silver Lake who was really well known as a musician named Tomato De Plenty. He had <laughs> uh, a band called the Screamers that were really quite well known that performed a whole lot, put out a lot of records there in all the punk history books, and. Uh, he was a very clever sort of uh, entrepreneur and performer. This was a, a script uh, for uh, all these people who did these, these uh, he just orchestrated friends of his from the uh, kind of punk art scene to come out and everyone did about sh five minutes from a different Shakespeare play. It was just hilarious. Mm -hmm. And we used to do these let's put on a show type events every so often. So um, that's... Um, uh, a bit more stuff. Oh, you wanted to talk about AIDS, and um, here is a, a, a very important figure in that struggle. I believe he, his name is Mark Kostopoulos. Uh, as you can see, he's wearing a lavender left sweatshirt and a PWA headband, person with AIDS, a new term in those days, being dragged away at a protest. This became a very famous shot by uh, photographer Chuck Stollard who lives in Silver Lake. Um, the, the ACT UP office, and ACT UP was formed in December of 1987, it's 20 years this year. Uh, their office was right um, at the junction over where the veterinarian office was, where the Buzz coffee shop was, it was upstairs there. And there was certainly a, uh, it was a city-wide group, but there was a high concentration of people in Silver Lake, a lot of meetings in Silver Lake, especially because the office was in Silver Lake. Uh, AIDS hit the city like, uh, you know, the whole city and certainly LA like uh, just a, a sort of a bomb with people getting sick before your eyes, often just disappearing. Uh, I remember one afternoon going to eat in a place called Sanborn House that's now several trendy clothing places. It used to be this sort of wonderful old 40s restaurant that it was kind of run down. And uh, there was a guy in there who had Kaposi sarcoma all over his, his arms and face. And it was really, really tragic. There was so little treatment then. And um, uh, very little was happening in terms of uh, county uh, health provisions. There was no AIDS ward until ACT UP LA demanded one. That was a unique action in the whole country where we actually focused on uh, uh, county health department and got them to turn around. Um, but uh, there were a number of just uh, extraordinary people, many of them gone. Marcus Topless is dead. Connie Norman, a transgender activist who had uh, been absolutely uh, a hero of ACT UP, very articulate and very vocal. She's now dead. Uh, there are a few people who stayed on long haul, but most of the people who were the strongest activists were uh, HIV infected themselves. They didn't mind getting arrested because they really thought they had very little to, to lose in terms of it was their life at stake. Do you remember uh, the Being Alive Center? Why don't we come over to this part sure. of the apartment? Yeah, this, is, this uh, column here is uh, by my friend Joe Becerra, who uh, very kindly uh, spent hours and hours with his tile sock creating this incredible mosaic. He's going on to amazing fame and fortune with this kind of uh, custom fine art mosaic work. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, there was an activist group called Being Alive that was composed of people with AIDS themselves uh, who really had to uh, scrounge to, to get any recognition and make sure that they were speaking for themselves and not just having health professionals and bureaucrats speak on their behalf about a problem that they were living with. Uh, being alive for a while set up its office in um, that place that had been called the jungle and then flamingos and is now cliff's edge um, and it's currently right next door here uh, at angus and griffith park in a place that was formerly a children's bookstore called happily ever after 
Um, one of the things about Silver Lake that made it an interesting, uh, slightly edgy place <laughs> in a really difficult way was the, the crime factor and the uh, tension between these different groups that were coming in. It had been a sort of a bohemian and political community. In the mid-century, it became a middle-class, working-class Latino community, largely in the 60s and 70s. And by the 80s, when the gays started coming in, they were seen as a threat. Uh, they were seen as gentrifiers who might be chasing out uh, Latinos. There were uh, uh, gangs of kids around, how formal or not, uh, who can say, but there were bashings and violence. Uh, I, for a while, was involved in a group called SNAP, the Silver Lake Action, Silver Lake Network Action Patrol. Uh, run by a guy named Bill Cabobianco, who had a clothing store called Fashion Panic, right next to a different light, um, because there were too many people getting beat up really badly, and uh, uh, you know, part of gay life is wanting the freedom to uh, walk around at night uh, without uh, having a death threat. Uh, what Michael McKinley did with Sunset Junction took a lot of the edge off the tension. But there were also a lot of individual stories of people uh, creating other, other ways and means to show there could be some coexistence. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. My pleasure. A wonderful take on, on our life here, and we appreciate your participation. Well, I'm so thrilled at what you guys are doing. So. <laughs>